our time is slipping by. Um, welcome to the Geography of the Sacred is where we're at today and beginning a new series. And um, as we begin, let's turn our hearts to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that you are for us and with us and that you are around us and that you love us and care for us. We ask that you be with us now as we learn the places that you've been uh, when you wandered this earth. And as we take a look and unpack some of that, Lord, that you guide and direct us and give us new insights. So we uh, just uh, place this time into your hands and ask for your guidance and direction. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So what I decided to do is um, last week we had uh, archaeology and Jesus. And I'm not really going to be looking at the archaeology here. I really was thinking of um, taking a look at some of the places where Jesus went and looking at what they look like today, which is really amazing because we're talking about over 2,000 years ago and we actually have a historical record, geographical places where Jesus was. And, uh, and the thing about the Holy Land, uh, the land of Israel, is there are many, many different layers. Like it's got so much history behind it. Like we're amazed when we pass by a church and it says 1886 or something here. But there you're looking at thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And that can be a bit overwhelming. And I'm not going to have all the details right for you, but we're going to at least try to do a little bit of exploring. And part of this comes from the fact that uh, both Anita and myself were in Israel and Jordan uh, at the beginning of this month, uh, beginning of February. So from February the 1st to the 17th, we were in Israel and Jordan, and we were able to go on this wonderful tour with a, a Jewish archaeologist uh, was our guide, and that was very interesting. The picture that you see in front of you here, the geography of the sacred, is a picture today. That's a picture I took about a month ago of the Dead Sea. And uh, so you're looking on the Israeli side over to the mountains in Jordan there. Um, and one of the things you may notice with the Dead Sea here is it's receding. You know, at one time it was further up. And then you can tell it's the Dead Sea because at the edges you see the white stuff there. So that's salt. So the, the, and of course the interesting thing with the Dead Sea is that the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea, but does anything flow out of the Dead Sea? Nothing. It's the lowest place on the earth, and nothing flows out of it. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. If something would flow out of it, it would be more of an alive sea. And then I think to myself, maybe that's sometimes we have to be careful. That if we just receive and receive and receive and nothing goes out of us but all comes into us, spiritually, materially, all those kinds of things, then our lives could be dead too. And so the more that the Dead Sea receives and never gives, the more saline it becomes and therefore nothing lives in it. Now the exciting thing about the Dead Sea, of course, if you can't swim, you want to be at the Dead Sea because <laughs> you don't have to swim there. You walk into about up to your waist and then you try sitting down. And as you sit down, everything comes up and it's like in an armchair you're sitting there. But if you turn it over on your belly, for instance, you can't because the back of your legs kind of go up and your face starts to go down and you don't want to get the salt in your eyes or then you're really in trouble. But anyways, the geography of the sacred. And the first place we're going to look at, let's see if I can do this. Oh, yes. So this is a map of Israel and Jesus' day. And so it's really good for us to kind of get that in, in our minds as to what it looks like. So it's a very narrow piece of land, of course. Um, and it starts at the top of the Sea of Galilee. If you can see that up there. Uh, that little body of water, and then it comes down with this river, that's the Jordan River, into the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, okay? So it's really good to have that picture, and what I'm going to do actually is I have a, um, um, a, a, geograph a ge uh, geological um, kind of a map of, of, of the Bible land, and I'm going to pass it around because it's really good if you get your, just even to feel it with your fingers to see where the high points are, where the low points are, uh, and places if you see, if you can locate Jerusalem and then locate Jericho and realize the Bible says, and Jesus went from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Why would he say down to Jericho? When you have the relief map, you'll see why. It's really accurate in, in terms of reflecting that. So... Yeah, so you can take a look at that. And uh, so again, we're going to be working today with, um, with Nazareth. So let's get a little closer into that area. Here we are. Un unfortunately, the yellow covers it up. But number eight, if you can picture it there, that's where Nazareth is located. Um, there are some other 
Uh, yeah, I don't have a pointer, but uh, that's fine. Okay, let's take a look at the town of Nazareth. Sorry that this slide is a little bit blurry because it comes from the internet rather than something that I could take. But this is today Nazareth. And the church you see, right, in, the thing you see, the big building you see in the middle, that's the Church of the Annunciation. So, um, Nazareth today is mostly an Arab Muslim town with a very, very low percentage of Christians being there. So the question is, why would I start with Nazareth? Why Nazareth? Why not Bethlehem? Any ideas? Which was? Yeah. Yes. Good point. Part of the problem with us Protestants is we tend to be anti Mary. <laughs> and so we really don't get too much into Mariology at all because we see how the, the Catholics and other uh, faiths pick her up so much and make her so high that almost she's more important than Jesus. And so what we've done is we've gone on the other extreme to not make her important at all, in a sense. But what happens here is that, uh, and when we were in Nazareth, uh, what happened here, as, uh, as Jerry points out, is the Annunciation. And so they built a big church, the Church of the Annunciation. Um, but as we begin, let's take a look at exactly what it says in, in, in Luke's Gospel here. And it's familiar, you will all know it, but it's again pointing out, if you want, you can grab your Bibles and take a look at that. Um, and I've got Anita sitting up here too because she's going to help me when I, <laughs> if I go astray here. <laughs> okay, we're looking at 26. So on page 991, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. So this is it. It's in Galilee and it's called Nazareth, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. A virgin is someone who's not had any relationships with a, with a male, sexual relationships. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God, and you will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus. He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, how will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be barren in, in her sixth month for nothing is impossible with God. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. I'm not sure when it all happened, but some, somewhere at this point in time, her egg was fertilized with the Holy Spirit. And the fact that it's mentioned in Scripture and the fact that there's a pointing, this is where the holy comes to the human. This is where it all begins, in the conception, in the womb. You see, and we don't want to miss that because this is how God chose to come to, to be in human form by, through the Virgin Mary. And so this gives, in a sense, a real sense of value to human life and where life begins is not in Bethlehem but in Nazareth at the conception when, when the, the, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and fertilized the egg, there's where you have it. That really brings a highlight to why we are so much against abortion. Um, because it's a sacred opportunity. This is a sacred thing that God has given to us. So um, from Latin, Annunciato, the act of announcing something. The Feast of Annunciation is March the 25th. Even in our Lutheran calendars, we have that as marked as the Feast of Annunciation. That's when God came for the first time in human flesh in an embryo. And then the word for Nazareth, that's interesting. The word for Nazareth has its Hebrew root, and we're not sure whether it's Nasar or Nasser. So if it's Nasar, it means to watch or to keep, being protected from the outside. If it's Nasser, it's a branch or shoot. In Isaiah 11, it talks about this, and you're going to see a, just a whole lot of um, what I consider um, profound moments here. 
Uh, Isaiah 11.1, 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And so we see here, in the town of, why Nazareth? Remember sometimes other places where you hear about Nazareth, it says, well, what good can come from Nazareth? What is Nazareth? Nazareth, even today, is an out-of-the-way place. It's really hard to kind of get to, in a sense. It's just not on any mean roads at all. It's a place that is kind of set apart or sacred or, or in a sense, it's a place that's protected. And so in a sense, um, and, and politically speaking too, we're going to find out too that this is a place that is in a different jurisdiction than Herod the Great or uh, the son that came after Herod who was a very um, vicious person. This is another person's uh, area. Herod Antipas is the one who's reigning in this area. And uh, so he doesn't seem to have Jesus on his radar. And by being raised in Nazareth, Jesus isn't on anybody's radar. So he has a safe place to be born. Um, so some, some passages that deal with Nazareth. Uh, we already read the one. The angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in Nazareth and announced that she would be with mother. Luke chapter 2, Joseph and Mary left Nazareth and went to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Um, Matthew 2, 21. After fleeing to Egypt to escape Herod's decree to murder the children of Bethlehem, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus returned to the land and settled in Nazareth. And Luke chapter 2, 41. Jesus' boyhood and young manhood were spent in Nazareth, though every year his parents went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And then in Luke chapter 4, 16, after Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River and temptation in the wilderness, he preached his first recorded sermon in Nazareth. The people of Nazareth responded angrily to Jesus' message and tried to kill him by throwing him off uh, the Mount of Precipice. And you can see the place where they think is the Mount of Precipice in Nazareth. Then Mark 6, 1 through 6, on a later visit to Nazareth, Jesus could perform few miracles because of the persistent unbelief of the people. So that's the history we have in Scripture of Nazareth. It's the place where God chose to bring uh, himself in human form in Mary. Okay, let's... Um, this is the Church of the Annunciation. Um, and verbum caro factum s whatever that, that means. Um, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so this is the, the, the Catholic Church... Uh, of the Annunciation, they built over top of a number of ruins. Um, and there were other churches that were built before this, and there were other churches built before that. And so they're all built on these ruins uh, where they come down to, and they see some caves that they found here where they've um, uh, identified the place where Mary or the angel would have come to Mary. Is it true? I don't know. Does it matter? Not really, in a sense that we know that it happened. Whether it happened here or 100 meters from here, or 200 meters from here. I don't think you can kind of put your mind around that. But tradition says, and we'll take a look at the caves actually, uh, where they believe that um, uh, Mary, Mary lived. So here's on the Basilica of the Annunciation it says, and the word became flesh. Historians tell us that the grotto and its surroundings being the site of the Annunciation were turned into a worship place in the first and second century. Early sources refer to the place as being the house of the Virgin Mary. What supports this claim are the numerous inscriptions on the walls mentioning Mary, which were left by pilgrims and visitors in early Christianity. In 427 uh, um, uh, AD, the first Byzantine church was built on the site. Then in the 12th century, a crusade church was built over the ruins of the Byzantine church. The current basilica, consecrated in 1969, is built over the grotto and the ruins of four earlier churches. So you can kind of get the idea that you know, it's really hard. And when we were at the ar uh, with the archaeologist, he's always looking for layers. Let's see if we can get to the earliest layer. We're really looking for first century layer, uh, as that will identify the time of Jesus. Of course, in the Church of the Annunciation, it's all about Mary. And different countries have made different uh, mosaics of um, Mary. And this is the one from the Philippines, where it talks about how God becomes human and a human becomes God and the conception was so significant that dates on the calendar were changed to reflect this miracle and the separation then between B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Or what now we're doing is B.C.E., before the Common Era, and C.E., the Common Era, it doesn't really matter because there's got to be something that separates them. And that, of course, is the, the, 
the uh, Annunciation or the coming of God in flesh. Any questions up to this point? Again, you can see the different depictions of Mary that they've all uh, come up with in Belarusia and Bulgaria, Italy, France, Ethiopia, and Liechtenstein, yeah. Schweiz, Liechtenstein, there you go. Here is one of the first churches they found in the grotto underneath the church. Um, uh, again, dating back to uh, probably before the Crusaders. And this is what I want to get at here. This is the caves they found. And let's unpack that a little bit. So let's just take a look. So they've got pillars in there that, of course, are just supporting it so it doesn't fall down. There's an entrance to the cave here. Well, let's get the next picture of the cave. Here we go. This, this is a better picture. Um, it's a, yes, it's a house. And so at the entrance here, you might see a little indentation for steps. And then you see in the far right there, it looks like um, actually it's a, a, an oven or an area where you could bake bread. So um, this would be the, the house that uh, in, in the first century that maybe Mary lived in. Um, you come into the entranceway, which is open on the, this part here, and then down the stairs into the next area, a kind of a living area. And behind that, there's even further a cave in there where they believed they would put the animals. So here's a thought for you. So they brought the animals into the back of the cave. Actually, it was a good thing that we went in February because it was really cold. And they bring the animals into the back of the cave because the animal body heat would help heat the rest of the cave. You know, um, so some thought was when there was no room in the inn, it, there was no room in the living area of the house. And so therefore, the only place they could go, I'm sorry, we don't have any room for you in the living area of the house. The only place you could go is to the very back of the house where there's the area for the animals and there maybe you can have the child there because you can't have the child in the other areas. The other part of the house here, right in the very foreground here, this kind of bit of a platform, they would say is that's where maybe the children would sleep. Um, and then down lower, down the steps, would maybe be where others would sleep. So let's talk about this area where the children would sleep. There would be probably pillars there, or posts there, and then probably kind of a roof, a grass roof to keep it cool. But, and then of course, you know, right down the stairs and to the right, there's that little niche is where the oven would be, where the bread would be kept. So let's go back to that parable about the man who came in midnight and asked for some bread because he had some guests that came in. And the person answered the door or whatever, says, I can't give you bread right now because I don't want to wake up the family because otherwise I'd have to walk through all these kids or whatever down the stairs into where the oven is to get the bread. I mean, it was an excuse. But it kind of gives you maybe a better idea of what that might have looked like in those days. Thoughts or comments? Yeah, James. Is Mary considered divine in a, in a Catholic system? I think that Mary's right up there. I mean, um, yeah, she might be considered divine. She often has a halo over her head. Um, and then one of the reasons why we, we, don't, we don't do Ave Maria, we don't sing that particular song, um, is because it gives the indication that Mar Mary prays for us sinners. And yet she herself is saying that she needs the Savior for herself. If Mary needs the Savior for herself, then she's not perfect. How can she intercede for us if she's, not, if she's just a sinner like us? And so that's why we would say we need to be really careful with what Scripture says about Mary. Scripture doesn't elevate Mary into being a person who is without sin. Um, scripture just says that Mary is the mother of Jesus, the Atokas, uh, the mother of God. Yes? And that she actually went up into heaven, body and soul. Yes. That she didn't die. In that she didn't die, right. And again, that's not... Okay, so again, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit to how we look at things as Protestants, in a sense. Uh, so within, the, within Orthodox and Catholic circles, they see the Word of God and the Word of Popes and Bishops kind of at the same level. 
right? Uh, for the Protestants, Luther said, no, let's go back to the, only the word of God, only faith, only grace. Uh, 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 and so therefore, for us, it's the word of God that's the ultimate. Everything has to fit under the word of God. If the word of God says it, then we believe it. If the word of God doesn't say it, then we take a look at historical facts and things like that, but it, it doesn't become for us uh, the, the number one thing. And so when we take a look at all those doctrines that we have, they have to be biblically supported. That doesn't mean to say that the words of the popes and the bishops and the church fathers aren't important. They, sh they sure are. We, Luther used a lot of Augustine's works. and all, I mean, there's really not much that we can invent today. It usually comes from some church father uh, in our theology today even. Uh, but we would, again, place ourselves under God's word. Um, and it doesn't say in God's word that Mary was without sin. It doesn't say that Mary was assumed into heaven. Um, but, but it, you know, and so therefore we don't say that either. And so... <clears throat> It does say that she was blessed among women, and so therefore we make the mistake of under, you know, um, um, not giving Mary the, you know, maybe the respect that she needs, and that's kind of the mistake we make in, in many of the Protestant circles. Uh, but she was highly favored by God. She was blessed among women. She's the one that was chosen by God to be the God-bearer uh, to, carry, to carry Christ. And so therefore... Um, that's important. But anyway, so that gives you an idea of what a first century uh, house would have looked like. Um, <clears throat> not far from Nazareth is the town of Canaan. Uh, it's like you can, it's, it's like a, uh, did I say how far it is? I don't say how far it is. It's only like about two or three kilometers away. And it's a Cana in Galilee uh, where Jesus comes to this wedding and changes water into wine. Cana is the site uh, where Jesus performed his first miracle when he changed water into wine at the wedding as recorded in John chapter 2. This takes place at a wedding. Jesus' presence at the wedding shows this is important. Getting marriage right, society works. The natural relationship in us is a marriage. That's why Jesus is the bridegroom who comes to make us his bride. In John 14, Jesus uses wedding language as he prepares a place for us. Remember in John 14, it says, do not let your hearts be troubled, do not be afraid. Um, a trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many, many rooms. If it was not so, I would have told you, and I go there to prepare a place for you. And where I go, I want you to come. And then and Thomas says, well, how do we know where to go? And then Jesus says, well, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But the fact, and I, this is very interesting, as I, it came to life for me when, we were, when our guide said to us, here's how you know when you're in a Jewish area or when you're in an Arab area, a Muslim area. And he says, look at the roofs of the houses. In the Muslim area, the roofs of the houses were flat. And in the Jewish area, the roofs of the houses were kind of a red roof with kind of a, an apex on them. And a lot of times in the, in the uh, Muslim or the Arab areas, the roofs, uh, the roofs of the house had the, what's that, the metal bars that go up? What's the? Rebar. rebar, thank you. The rebar was sticking up in the corners. And I asked our guide, why, why, why are they unfinished their houses? How come their houses aren't finished? He said, oh no, they probably have sons and daughters and they're going to get married and another floor goes on and another floor goes on, right? Because then the son has to, once the son gets engaged, he goes back to his father's house and he prepares a room. And once that room is finished, it takes maybe about a year after the betrothal, then he brings his bride to the new flat that he's built on top of his father's house. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go there to prepare a place for you. So you see, that's really wedding language that God is talking about. And so therefore, when we understand what Jesus is saying to us, is he's saying, you know what? When you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are now engaged. <laughs> you now have a boyfriend. You now have this person who's committed to you 100%. He's Jesus. And the culmination of the betrothal will take place at the great marriage feast when you go to be with him in heaven. Now that's the big marriage feast when we go to be with the Lamb. Amazing, the imagery that God uses in marriage language. And so that kind of puts it again uh, together for you in perhaps a, a more profound way. So when Jesus comes to um, Cana and Galilee, um, he talks to us again about how important marriage is because he honors marriage by his presence. We talk about how life is brought into conception uh, through uh, the sperm and the egg coming together. Uh, therefore, that's life for the Christian. That's sacred for, Jesus, for God. And so that's why abortion for us is something that we want to try to avoid at all costs. Uh, and try to find other alternatives or ways. That's why marriage is so sacred in the eyes of the Lord, uh, because he uses that whole uh, paradigm for us. The church in Canaan, so there, there it is. Um, there. <clears throat> um, John 2. 
Uh, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons, that's 75 to 150 liters. On the right, you can see uh, one of those jars. Uh, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them now to draw some water out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you've saved the best to now. I couldn't believe how big that thing was. I mean, I don't think you can move it very easily. But you can imagine, it was, of course, used for purification. That's looking on the inside of it, you know. Now, let me just pick up on that for a minute. I don't remember, I, maybe you remember me preaching a sermon on this once. But uh, I want to just talk a little bit about this. It's more of a philosophical thing. John talks about the fact that this is the first of the signs. Changing water into wine. And in Greek, when he uses the word first of the signs, this is one that tops them all. It's almost like he's saying, which of these is not like the other? Can you guess which one? And then he starts to do miracles in John's gospel. And John is trying to say to you, this first miracle is not like the other miracles. Can you figure that out? And which of all the miracles that you're going to now see matches the first one? And if you really think about it for a moment, the one that matches the first one is the last one. And the last one is the resurrection of Jesus. Now let me put it together for you. The first miracle is changing water into wine. There is nothing in the water, there's no DNA that would make it wine. Absolutely nothing. He has to do a completely new creation out of nothing into something. He's got to change the molecules, he's got to do everything he possibly can, whatever it takes to take water and make it into wine because there's nothing in there that's wine. If I have an eye that's blind and you heal my eye, you've got something to work with. It's an eye. It's not like there's a hole in my socket and you have to make an eye. There's an eye there. If my limbs are paralyzed, you use my limbs to straighten them and heal them, but they're all, the substance is there. If there's bread and fish, you just multiply them, the substance is there. If you're resuscitating somebody, the person is there. You resuscitate. I'm using my words carefully. You resuscitate the person. Lazarus was resuscitated and Lazarus died. Jesus was not resuscitated. Jesus was resurrected and he never died. Somehow, his substance was mysteriously changed into something that wasn't any more material, earthly. Something that wasn't there was put there. Which of these do not look like the other? The water into wine, changing something that was not there into something, and the body that was material into supernatural. I think that's what John was trying to tell us. This was the first, the RK, of the miracles. Now, it's kind of like the book ends. When the last one comes, you'll see a tremendous change from the material to the supernatural. Yes? So after the resurrection, Yeah, after Jesus met with the disciples, he meets with the substance and disappears? Yes. His resurrected... Yeah, so the resurrected body of Christ is something that we're, we, we don't have any, we just don't know how, how different it is, but it's really different, isn't it? He can come into a locked room. He can disappear and come back again. He's not a spirit, and, and that's why he purposely gives us the recording of him eating fish and bread because the, uh, uh, the, the people in those days believed that a spirit couldn't eat, didn't need to eat. The other thing is that Jesus really wanted to know that he was truly material as well. Otherwise, why would he still have the wounds in his hands? Why would he show us the wounds? He could have just been resurrected with no wounds. They would have all been healed. But he wanted to point out to us that that, that, that was him, and, and he, he had that for a reason. So anyways, these are the huge wine uh, containers, or the water containers that they used to fill with wine. Okay, we're moving. We're moving to a place that may, maybe nobody has heard of. This place is called Sephorus. Sepphoris is only in ruins, but this is the view from Sepphoris, and I'm not sure you're probably, maybe you could be, I'm not sure where we're looking. We could be looking over Nazareth up there. But Sepphoris was a Roman colony that was about nine kilometers away from Nazareth. Okay? This was a Roman colony that was destroyed. When Herod the Great died in 4 BC, there was an uprising to see if they could get control. As a result of the uprising, they raised Sepphoris to the ground. They just destroyed it. 
Then Herod Antipas came on the throne and he wanted to rebuild it. So in Jesus' lifetime, in Jesus' uh, lifetime as a, teen, as a child and a teenager, Sepphoris was being rebuilt. And in Sepphoris, not only was it kind of like a Roman colony, but also the Jews were there building a synagogue. Let your mind think for a moment on that one. It's not mentioned in the Bible. So Sepphoris is the capital of Galilee. It was located about nine kilometers from Nazareth. Uh, capital until the new capital was established in the city of Tiberias on the Lake of Galilee. Or the, it was a, okay, so it was a Roman city with Jewish influence. There was a theater there. So this is the thinking that uh, Jesus, that Jesus' father was a carpenter. The word in Greek is a tekton, which really isn't just a carpenter. It means a craftsman or a person who can work with many materials although their specialty might be wood, but they could also work with stone as well. They're not typically a stonemason, and they're not specifically a carpenter, but they're a craftsman. So Joseph needs work. Where is he going to find work? Well, nine kilometers away, there's this, this great big city being built, and they need all sorts of craftsmen to help. Is it possible that Joseph and his son, Jesus, were able to find work in Sepphoris and help build the synagogue? Well, employment's there for him. That's for sure. And so some people are thinking that might be the case. Sepphoris is up on a hill. Sepphoris has a great Roman theater. So we put two to two together. What does Jesus talk about? A city on a hill. Remember, he uses those illustrations. Don't, you know, don't cover your lamp on a hill, but let everybody see it. That would be a great place for him to get that illustration from. He would have seen that. Or in the theater, uh, the theater, they, they have the word hypocrite. Hypocrite really means an actor. It means somebody hypo Kritos, it means someone who's underneath a mask. Somebody who's being some, something they're not. And so the many references that Jesus used for hypocrite could have been from his, as a young boy, seeing what was going on in the theater or being exposed to some of that with his father, Joseph. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. But, but you see, wow. You start to take a look at these dots and put them together and you say, that would make sense. I wouldn't build theology on it, people, but, but what I am saying is that how wonderful it was for us to be able to go to Sepphoris, see that it was in ruins, see that the fact that it was built during Jesus, or rebuilt during Jesus' time, it's so close to Nazareth, and it's right up on a hill. It's also on the main wayfair. Uh, the Via Maris comes past uh, through that area. Sepphoris is up at an area where you can look all over, so it's a, a good fortress, and it's on a major trading route. Nazareth misses the trading routes. It's kind of out on its own, Nazareth, and so therefore it would be a great place to protect Jesus in a sense, or to, to help raise him in the ways of God, so that he wouldn't be so, you know, the, so that the corruption area wouldn't be. It's almost like homeschooling in your protected area in a sense. Uh, very careful about that, uh, you know. So, um, any thoughts or comments that uh, anybody wants to make? Yes, Lydia. Yes, they are doing a lot of digging in Sepphoris now. Um, yes. So they've discovered a lot. And they've discovered a lot as well. A lot of mosaics. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting is, and it's so confusing, that there's a synagogue in Sepphoris, and in the synagogue there's mosaics in the synagogue that has pictures of people. And you think to yourself, that doesn't make sense. The Jews didn't want any pictures of anybody. Don't make any graven image, right? And then all of a sudden you realize, wow, this Galilee is a really confusing place. It's not pure. The Gentiles are mixed with the Jews, and the Jews are mixed with the Gentiles, and the Romans are all in there. It's all a hodgepodge of everything. Ah. And then you think to yourself, why would Jesus begin his ministry there? Because he wanted to witness not just to the Jew, but also to the Gentile. And so therefore, that's a perfect place to go. Because there you have a mix-up of Gentiles and Jews, and Jesus wanted to say, you know what? I came for the whole world, not just for one group of people. And that's why I'm in the... And later on in Capernaum, you'll see that, because he's reaching out to everybody. And what a... And I could see if I was a, a religious Jew in Jerusalem, you know, where the real true blue people are, you know, I would be contempt for Galilee. We really don't want those Jews from Galilee around us, you know. They're, they're kind of polluted, they got those Gentiles all around them, and there's, they're not the pure guys, you know. We're, we're the guys that wear the right garb and know how to do the right things, but, you know, so what good can come from Galilee or from that area? Again, Sepphoris is here. They're on the right where they uh, place, that's a, uh, they're continuing with their dig. 
underneath that area there on the right where you can see it covered. And again, uh, Okay, politics. Galilee was a separate administrative region from Judea in the south centered in Jerusalem. Herod the Great's violent son Archelaus controlled Judea. Galilee was controlled by Herod Antipas when Romans made him tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. Destroyed completely after an uprising at the death of Herod the Great in 4 BC, Herod Antipas immediately decided to rebuild it. Throughout Jesus' young life, this would have been a major building site. Mark 6.3, Joseph was a tecton, a word which often translated carpenter refers to a craftsman of wood and can include stone material as well. And here you see this is our, the tour that we were with sitting in the theater in Sepphoris that they still have there. And you could really tell if it was a Roman, if it was a Roman, if it was a Roman colony, there are certain things you look for. You look for a theater, you look for baths, Romans love the Roman baths, uh, and a lot of times you look for maybe a hippodrome or, or something like that. A hippodrome, um, hippo means horse, Hippopotamus, potamus means river, so a hippopotamus is a river horse. A hippodrome is, a, is a, uh, uh, a cycle or a circle, the horse circle where they run, the hippodrome, you know, and so you'd, uh, like a Colosseum uh, area. That's it for the slides. Any, um, any other th thoughts or comments as we take a look at our first geography of the sacred and uh, see what we see? Yeah. Is there a place called Safad? Safad. Because you were there, they call that city on the hill. Oh, it could be Zephyr. Uh, Sepphoris is also called Siphor because it means bird in Hebrew. And they think it, they, they've called it like bird because it's on a hill, like a bird would be perched up. And so they called it kind of like Bird Hill, if you want to call it that. Um, so that's maybe where you're getting that from. Uh, but yeah, again, in, uh, in Israel, it's really confusing because there are so many different layers of things and then different, uh, different tr uh, Christian traditions have built churches on different things. So it's really hard sometimes to figure out what, what is real and what isn't. Where was Jesus really at? We'll talk about one of the, the things that we went with our tour is there's the Sermon on the Mount, the church where the Sermon on the Mount is, the basilica that's there. And we got off of our bus and we never went to the church at all. Our archaeologist guy took us to the servants' lane, where they are, where the kind of greenhouses are in that area, and then we started walking down a trail to the Sea of Galilee. And I'm saying, why are we doing this? And then uh, all of a sudden, the uh, guide says to us, "Look at your feet. What do you see on this trail?" And sure enough, there was some basalt stone that was kind of long. And he says, "Do you see that stone on the right?" And he says, "Yeah. Do you know what that is?" I says, "No. It's a curb stone." The Romans would have built a road here, and they would have had a basalt curbstone there to let you know that, that this was, you know, that, that was part of their roads. And so this is more than likely a road in Jesus' day that Jesus would have walked on. And so we know that kind of for a fact. And so that was really neat as we were making our way down, as we all walked, instead of taking the bus down to the Sea of Galilee from where Jesus uh, was doing the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll cover that. So we're looking at the geography of the sacred, places that Jesus would have been, uh, what do they look like today? And uh, the kind of hopefully reinforcing for you the fact that Jesus was a historical figure, uh, that Jesus um, was at these places, uh, and that just kind of uh, solidifies or anchors your faith in, in history and uh, geography as well. Any other questions or thoughts? Gordon. Can you uh, quickly explain how they can build churches on top of ruins of churches on top of ruins of churches? <laughs> That's a telltale. <laughs> Did you catch that one? <laughs> so what, what they have is they, every time you see a mound somewhere, it's called a tell. Tel Aviv, the new mound. Tel Aviv, the new city of Tel Aviv, is built beside the city of Joppa. And Joppa is the place where Jonah was, and Joppa is the place where Peter saw the vision. And so what happens is that after, uh, these aren't interesting places for other people, so they come and they destroy and they decide, I don't, like this house here. That, well, I mean, it's kind of what we do, right? Don't we have this big ongoing battle? Should we take down the Electra home building? And what's happening in Cambridge with that big hotel over there? And, and so let's just destroy it. And other people say, no, we need to keep it for posterity. Well, you can imagine what was going on in those days. You know, who needs this, uh, this cave here? Well, they say that Jesus was in the cave. Yeah, take it down. We're going to build a temple here. We'll, we'll build something else here. Or the Muslims come in and say, anything that has to do with Jesus, knock it down. We don't want it. And that's what happened too. 
They destroyed all those sites. And you'll find out when you get to the Church of the Nativity, they didn't destroy the Church of the Nativity. Why? Because they saw a depiction of three uh, of wise men that looked like they were Persians. And they're saying, our guys were here. We can't destroy this building. And so they left it standing. And so therefore we know the authenticity of the Church of the Nativity because the Muslims let it stand. And so a lot of the people that would come in, they would just destroy things. And you hear that too with ISIS, remember? Where did they go in the Middle East? And they just destroyed all of the, the cultural ruins that were there, right? And so that happens again and again as conquerors come. And then, uh, and then you get someone like Herod the Great who figures, I'm going to show you how to build a temple better than Solomon's temple. And he's, so he builds a temple for himself or whatever, and we'll get into that too later on. But yeah, so there's all these ruins that, because people just destroy them. And then you have your archaeologists that come in and start digging up these ruins and find out they get to later and later dates of finding what's going on. And it's just like we have too. I think what's happening is a Fisher Hallman or Homer Watson or somewhere out there. They found these Indian heads out in that area and so now they're making it into our archaeological dig there because they just went over the graveyard and just build your houses up over top of that. And so that's kind of an ongoing thing. So we are blessed actually to have what we do have uh, in the Middle East and in Israel. Yeah. Like right, as Anita's pointed out, that's like thousands of years of history that you're dealing with, not just a couple of hundred years. Uh, I see our time is gone. Let's close with a word of prayer. And next Sunday, we're going to meet and talk about Bethlehem. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together this, uh, this morning, and we ask that you uh, continue to bless our time and uh, bless us as we, some of us stay for the word, as uh, they've already heard the word, that you bless the word to us as we hear it preached this morning too. And we pray for our... Uh, Christians all around the world, and uh, we ask that you be with them and bless them and come alongside them as well, and uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.